So to uh, recap, you're, uh, you discovered as a young man, you um, really came to understand it further as an adult that your grandfather was the head of the clan, or at least one of the main leaders here in the Eastern Panhandle. And as a, a young man who's continued to grow and mature, uh, you realized the responsibility that's put on your shoulders uh, to effectively atone for his uh, sins, basically the, the sins of the grandfather mm -hmm. in this case uh, conveyed to the sins of the grandson, and you were looking to make right on that. What, as you learned about other members, and we know in reading your story about the Rolodex of members that you came across as a young man, you said your mission was not to out other members, so to speak, but you hope that they will also come out and do the same thing that you have done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the purpose of the um, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Committee of the and of the local NAACP, which um, I chair and and Zaki is a member of, is uh, not to intentionally embarrass anyone. If you will recall back when, when apartheid finally collapsed in South Africa, the process um, of dealing with that was called the truth and reconciliation process. So things didn't descend into uh, violence and warring factions and people calling each other names and all the rest of that stuff. Um, that's sort of a model for what it is we are trying to do here. So one of the reasons why we are um, on the program is to get the word out to both the African-American community, the black community, and even in some ways more importantly, the white community in Martinsburg, so that people can begin to share the reality of stuff that did happen uh, particularly uh, after World War I, uh, when, when is what is called the Second Plan uh, was developed. There's an article in the Martinsburg Journal from 1921 which talks in, at length about the, the development of the Klan and, and what its goals are and its white supremacy. And this stuff was out in the public eye being talked about by a lot of people for a long time in our community. And it's been uh, either forgotten or hidden um, in, the, in, the, in the ensuing 50 years or more. So one, one of the primary things we're trying to do is return people's attention to it and hopefully begin to develop information about exactly who did what to whom and how during that period. And again, our guests in studio, Dr. S. Bailey Sherbet, Distinguished Professor of English Emeritus 2006, West Virginia Professor of the Year at Shepherd, and the University for the Center for Appalachian Studies and Communications, and also uh, Dr. Zaki McGill, who is the former president of the NAACP, Chair of the Seeking Truth Committee as well. So uh, how did the two of you come across Mr. Thompson, Sylvie? Let's start with you first, and, and what was your interaction like? Well, sure. This was actually about a month or so ago, and um, both Saki and uh, Bill got in touch with me. They wanted to have some conversation. They wanted to share uh, Bill's ideas about truth and reconciliation, and they wanted to see whether or not the Center for Appalachian Studies and Communities would be willing to help them uh, in terms of research and providing some student projects and this kind of thing. So I, I just thought it was fascinating and, you know, the history that they were giving about their own experiences, particularly Bill's experiences, pretty much echoed mine. I come from Georgia. And um, so my family, I have the same kind of family background, though a different part of the country and this kind of thing. And I've, I've shared this story before uh, that when I was a child, I was probably not more than seven or eight or nine years old, there was a church party that we had out at Stone Mountain. And some of the kids were playing hide and seek. And as we were exploring and goofing off, it was evening, there was a light on the other side of of the mountain and we just went over there and we saw the Ku Klux Klan and it was mesmerizing to me it, even as a child not understanding being 
in this kind of southern mystique that you grow up in if you're in the deep south it seemed to me like the embodiment of evil it never left my consciousness my mind nor anything else so i've always had this sense of you know these defining moments that happen to you where you have come to a recognition of, of evil, and you want to do something about it. And then, as a teacher, you know, obviously, you want to bring stories to light, stories of truth to your students. And for the Center for Appalachian Studies and Communities, that is what we're mostly interested in, is telling the West Virginia story. We're really interested in local history and this kind of thing. And so when uh, Zaki and Bill came to me and with this project, it seemed like just the kind of thing we would want to share with our students. I put out a call to uh, the graduate students in particular. They're, we have a great graduate program in Appalachian studies. These students are very mature, they're very serious, they're great researchers. And uh, we had a couple of students that answered the call, Jesse Shanholtz uh, and uh, Trey Miller, but particularly Jesse, she was quite interested in this. We were going to give them, because it takes a lot of their time, their research, we were going to give them some course credit for what they were doing, but Jesse has already put out a plan about uh, researching you know, at the Bird Center and in local history to kind of give a head start to this program in terms of the hardcore research. So the students in the Appalachian Studies program, because they understand that telling the story is the way that you keep people engaged and you keep people on, on a just road, they were quite interested in this. And so we're just providing some of the manpower, person power, for um, students to help along with this uh, truth and reconciliation in terms of research and local history and that kind of thing. So that's where Center for Appalachian Studies comes into play. Ducky? Uh, Bill Thompson uh, approached the NAACP several years ago while I was still president of, of the, uh, the unit and uh, expressed to me that uh, he knew that his family had a, a racist past and he wanted, uh, you know, to reconcile that. He wanted to heal from that. And so he immediately joined our um, lynching project. We had a, a historical lynching project, um, community project, to uh, unearth the, uh, the history of the two, at least two lynchings that had occurred in Berkeley County. And uh, so Bill was very instrumental along with a, a whole, um, a, a, a huge committee uh, of about 12 people who did all sorts of uh, research uh, with the, the National Archives and local papers and, and, and the archives of the black press and so forth to try to elucidate what had happened in the lynching of Joe Burns. And um, that culminated in, in contacting ancestors of Joe Burns um, having a, uh, a banquet, a, a commemoration of the lynching at the, the uh, Purple Iris uh, restaurant, which was the grounds in, on which Joe Burns was lynched. And at that time, we had about 50 of Joe Burns' ancestors come, and we experienced that as a very healing um, process, a very healing event in, in which um, White folks and, and, and the ans of a black ancestors of Joe Burns um, got together over a meal and, and there was singing. Um, many of the members are, are uh, uh, the, res uh, the ancestors of Joe Burns were members of churches, were pastors, were in the choir. So there was singing and commemoration. And I'll never forget uh, one young woman who, uh, very professional, she's probably like a great, 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 great niece of Joe Burns, um, graduate of Shepherd University. And she talked about how she would often have professional meetings at the Purple Iris um, in, in, in which, you know, there was, a, she would participate in the meetings and yet she knew that those were the grounds uh, upon which this ancestor had been lynched. So it, it had a painful connotation, uh, but that day, uh, seeing the support, the family members gathered, the community uh, of, of Martinsburg and Berkeley County gather uh, to acknowledge this atrocity uh, was a very healing um, uh, process for her. 
And she said she would never have a, a meeting or a dinner at the Purple Iris again in which she didn't feel uh, uplifted and, and, and healed from that experience. So, so Bill Thompson was very instrumental in that project. And um, just a, 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 a couple of months ago, we had the uh, debut, the viewing of the um, the documentary of the Sumner Raymer School. Uh, Sumner Raymer was the the segregated uh, school for colored children, where my father, his brothers and sisters had had attended uh, here in Martinsburg, and um, the chair of the NAACP Education Committee, Faye Stumps, at the time said that you know this is living history this 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 building the school uh the the photographs that leonard and helen harris have accumulated and saved in the museum all these years and there needed to be a documentary so it, um she reached out to the west virginia humanities council who uh gave funds uh to to produce a documentary of the school and its history and the history of the whole sumner Raymer uh, school systems across uh, many states. I don't know if people realize it, but Sumner was a senator uh, who was beaten uh, uh, brutally. Caned, on, if I remember the term. Would you say? Caned, Caned if I yes, remember the term. On, on, on the, uh, the floor of the Senate uh, for his, you know, uh, opposition to slavery and, and and segregation and his belief that that black people were, were should be equal citizens um, and f out of that grew uh, an effort to uh, open these schools to educate black children uh, many of them uh, you know the first first generation uh, out of slavery and it became known as the Sumner schools and uh, 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 Martinsburg was the site of one of those. So at at that viewing of the documentary, which was it was a it was a packed audience at our historic Apollo Theater um, that Sunday afternoon. Um, afterwards, there was a panel discussion with people who had attended the summer school, and um, as part of that panel, Bill Thompson spoke and uh, revealed his, the the history of his family and the Klan. Uh, and his belief that, um, you, you, you know, the, the, the revelations of history are not just for black people, it's also for white people, that slavery, segregation, Jim Crow has, 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 has done damage to the psyche of not only black people but also white people, and there needs to be some sort of effort and process in which uh, blacks and whites can heal from the ravages of the, those abuses of the past. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, thanks folks for coming in. This is a fascinating discussion. Uh, you mentioned lynching. Uh, you said there were two in Berkeley County. What period of time were they? Uh, Bill, Bill, I believe they were the late 1800s. Right. Uh, maybe early. Uh, one was uh, late 1800s and one was early 1900. Yeah. Bill, Bill yeah. Thompson, you had something to add on that? No, no. In fact, he's right. He's got it. Okay. 1886 and 1874. Okay. okay. And I was thinking actually Ku Klux Klan was uh, started a little bit after that, but obviously I'm wrong. It must start in the late 1800s. Uh, well, there, there were two. There were two clans. I mean, well, there have been more than two clans. Mm -hmm. But the first clan started after the after the Civil War, and there's there's references to the clan. In the, new, in the local newspapers in the Eastern Panhandle back in the 18, late 1860s. Um, in, the, in 1868, the Shepherdstown Register had an article about the, the local Klan. Um, the second Klan, which is what we're talking about, is uh, basically came to life right around the time of the World War I yeah. and was at its, at its height between World War I and World War II. There is currently... Uh, white supremacist activity going on in our community. I mean, I, I just had a phone conversation with an elected official in the Eastern Panhandle a few days ago in which that person related to me some threats and other stuff that were going on with regard to uh, um, segregation, uh, the, being opposed to, to uh, integration. You know, all that kind of stuff is... is Unfortunately, it's coming back, yes. and that's why this project is doubly important, 
because if we don't learn our history, we're going to repeat it. Bill, I read your uh, uh, five or six page uh, uh, piece. I found it to be very informative, uh, very touching, also a very easy read. What's going to be the distribution of your of this piece? Well, it's on it's on the local NAACP website, um, so people can get to it by simply um, getting onto the site. I I I couldn't remember off the top of my head the, how you navigate to get to it, but um, I don't think it's that hard to get to. And as well, we have a mailbox um, at the uh, NAACP which people are invited to send information or questions or anything having to do with all of this stuff. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell that, uh, I'll give you that right now. It's um, seekingtruthepwv at gmail.com. So that's all one word, Seeking Truth Eastern Panhandle, West Virginia, epwv at gmail.com so folks are invited to um contact us because that's the whole point of this is to get people involved and to get information shared nobody's going to be um you know if if they talk if people tell us about family and stuff like that uh, name names whatever we're not going to turn right around and make all of that stuff public because we're not here to embarrass people what we're here to do is start a conversation and eventually as people are comfortable and agree some of this material and and personal connections and family histories and stuff may be shared publicly but none of that will happen unless until the people who are involved are comfortable with it if we uh, could uh, take a breath we'll be right back with the second half of our uh, hour here and our panelists here bill thompson dr sherbert dr Zicky McGill as well. Uh, via telephone, Bill Thompson, grandson of a Klan leader here in the Eastern Panhandle many years ago. And uh, Dr. Sylvia Sherbet and Dr. Zicky McGill in studio as well. And uh, we're going to go to John for a question in a moment here. Uh, Bill, I want to bring you back into the conversation as well. If you could take a couple of minutes and tell us what it was like uh, growing up as a grandson of a Klan leader here in this area. And there's a Confederate flag story that I'd like you to tell, if you could, in regards to handing that down through the generations in your family and sure. uh, posting it sure. on the wall. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Um, uh, let me start by giving a little bit more um, uh, context for what the Klan was uh, after World War One. It wasn't just about African Americans or black people. It was also anti-Catholic anti-Jewish and anti-immigrant um, so that in the white community there were victims of the Klan as well. Um, so when I was a little kid, uh, my best friend uh, who lived right up the street uh, on South Queen Street was, was a Catholic kid. And um, my grandfather uh, was not very comfortable about that. And uh, tried to sort of uh, dissuade me from being buddies with this kid. And I'm, I'm like six years old at that point, right? Well, that didn't work. Um, the, the growing up um, was the shadow of the Confederacy, the lost cause. Um, and, and both sides of my family, I mean, on the other side of my family, I've recently, as I uh, indicate in the document that I created, um, uh, Buck Martin, who was the uh, uh, editor of the journal many years ago, who's a relative on, on the other side of the family, apparently also during, during that period. So there were a lot of people in important places and influential places in the community who were, who were involved. So um, when I was a kid, we played Confederate soldiers, my cousins and I. Bill, Bill, we're losing your cell a little bit. I'm not sure if you're moving around or not, but uh, the cell's gotten a little shaky in the last minute. You still with us? Okay. Is that better? Uh, it was a second ago, and then you just got a little crazy there for a second. Okay. Am I all right? I'll, t I'll tell you what. Um, 
why don't you hang up and then call it? Can you hang up and call us back? Maybe we can get a better sell here. Sure. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, please All do right, that. I'll call you right back. That's uh, Bill Thompson. In the meantime, we'll come back to the Seeking uh, Truth Project here at uh, Shepherd and, and Zaki. How far does this project go in terms of, it, it, does it have an end date to it, or does it continue through infinity here? <laughs> what? Uh... Hopefully not through infinity, mm -hmm. um, but it, it is a new project. Uh, it's only a few months old, and uh, it, it, Bill just got uh, approval from the NAACP membership uh, uh, two meetings ago to go forward with this. Uh, uh, got the blessing of the current president, uh, Gloria, Gloria Carter, uh, to pursue, to, to invite other members to join, and we're in the process of just reaching out to the community uh, we've had some people uh, express, uh, especially uh, uh, black, some black people express concern that this could bring retribution against them um, for speaking up or, or, or indicating um, uh, actions that, that they are aware of uh, growing up. And, but we're hopeful that, that the message that this is about truth and, and reconciliation, that it's really about healing the wounds of the past will be the overriding theme that people will become operate will operate under. I understand we have Bill back via telephone. Okay. Bill, welcome back. Yep. Okay, I'm here I am. Yeah, that sounds much better. Then go ahead and, and continue, Bill, with your youth and your uh, 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 childhood as the grandson of a clan leader. Sure. So um, in 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 my bedroom, uh, as long as I lived at home was uh, a um, set of the five Confederate flags. There were five flags that were used um, in the Confederacy, depending upon what period uh, and how many states were, had joined the, uh, con the Confederacy. And those were put in a place of um, veneration. And uh, when uh, my son was born uh, in the 1980s, my mother uh, brought that uh, the, the, the flag to my <laughs> to my wife uh, and said, "Here they are, so you can put them on the wall." And uh, b at by that time, obviously, um, I was not uh, supportive of the idea, and my wife um, was certainly not as well. So uh, the flags were. Uh, politely but firmly um, rejected and it was the beginning of an interesting conversation with my parents about what they took for granted um, that, you know, this, this old stuff should continue to be venerated. And uh, the, rest of, uh, the rest of history in my family has been a continuing conversation among uh, my cousins and me and other people uh, about what all this means. And frankly, there are disagreements uh, within my family about how to handle our um, Confederate past. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details for the very same reasons that we've been talking about, because we're not here to embarrass folks. But uh, it is not without some tension that I am uh, being outspoken. John frankly. Gilstrap. <clears throat> yeah, I want to get to... Um... You, you brought it up, Zaki, the, the issue, fears of retribution. I, I think the goals of the is it healing project, is that what it's called? I think the goals of the healing project. Truth and, re truth and reconciliation. Truth and, second, tr truth and reconciliation project. Okay. I, I, I think the goals are terrific, and I think that they're necessary. But I think the realities, as demonstrated over the course of the past few years, um, I, I think there's... I worry that there is cause for fear of retribution. You know, you look, I'm in the entertainment business, right? And um, cancel culture is real. You look at what happened to Paula Dean when asked a direct question if she'd ever, you know, used a racial epithet and she said she had, she lost everything. She lost her TV show, she lost, you know, the, the whole thing. Um, having grown up a Southerner at a certain period of time and, and, and that's, that's what she said. So I, I worry, I, you know, I, I think it's worthwhile for people to, you know, from the Rolodex to come forward if they're aware that their grandparents or their parents or maybe they themselves are 
reformed members of of the clan and they want to come forward and, and and confess this it probably is soul cleansing but isn't there a real solid chance of retribution and bad things following in terms of if you're a businessman or a business person that that just being canceled and essentially run out of town these days I, I don't I don't think so I, I because I, because the very basis of this project is is uh, truth and reconciliation uh, just like you know the the format in, in South Africa upon which we're basing our project was that there is no punishment um, there is to be no punishment that that your your coming forward is uh, is done in the safety of being allowed to reveal what happened, what you did, and and to uh, make a, make amends, make a, atonement to those that, that that you had abused or, or mistreated. But you can't um, control the Twitterverse. No, can't can't control the tri Twitterverse. Um, uh, however, I think uh, it's all about approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my abiding uh, premise is that the, the the antidote for hate is not love, it's conversation. The antidote for hate is not love, it's conversation. And this is, this is about starting a conversation. Uh, exactly, and, exactly. Go ahead, Bill. No, the key is, ha, has really nailed it. It's about starting a conversation. And, you know, being vulnerable and sharing tough stuff, it, there is risk involved, but it's the risk of engagement and healing. Uh, and you know, when, when someone finally gets the courage to be vulnerable and to uh, name it, you know, like, like the 12-step program, you know, you, 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 you name it. And then you confront it by being honest with yourself and with everybody else. Uh, that's what it is we're talking about here. And in the absence of that, everyone retires to their own corner, and the same stuff can happen again. Uh, Bill, you mentioned your cousins, that you do not talk a lot about this with your cousin. But when you do have discussion, what's the tenor of the discussion? Is it a, a fairly uh, lighthearted objective, or is it a lot of tension and emotional involved? Uh, it, it depends upon the context, both. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there's just some disagreement. I mean, uh some of my relatives are very have very different opinions about the the legacy of the Confederacy than than I do, and um, we respect each other. We love each other. We continue to be in relationship. It doesn't. It's it's not you know finger pointing and all the rest of that, but we are honest about how we feel, and the beginning of the. In the long haul, as far as I'm concerned, that's the beginning of the healing process. Because yeah. without without understanding the history and without coming to terms with it, you are, as I've said before, you are in danger of repeating it. And as current events are showing us, repetition of this stuff can and will happen. So this is Sylvia, and I'd, I'd like to talk about for a moment those current events that we're experiencing, because as, as an educator, I'm hearing all of the time, uh, particularly in the state of West Virginia, that we need to censure what we talk about in the classroom, and we need to be mindful of this, mindful of that, not hurt this f set of feelings and, and the like. I think that when you're the only way really to... Uh, arrive at truth and understand your history and the story that West Virginia has, which is a fascinating story, it's a story filled with so many positives as well as some negatives as well, is to openly talk about these things, to let students explore and the like. But we are in, I believe, um, 
a period of backlash where there is a lot of concern about bringing into the classroom uh, any of these negative things that might hurt the feelings of this or that person or anybody who might feel he might have to be censured and the like. I think you have to have free and open conversation about issues, as Zaki has said and as Bill has said, so that you don't repeat history, so that you understand history. I think free and open... I think free and open conversation is actually the way to full understanding. How, is, how else do you get there? I just question the, the confession piece. I don't understand why that's, that's an important part of that. I don't know why. I mean, uh, Zaki, you're a psychiatrist, correct? Uh, don't you counsel people not to carry the burdens of their ancestors to get past that? You are your own person. You are not that that bad person in your past, you are your own person and, and move on. So how is, how is that burden something that is, is something that, that, that the past generation, how should this generation f even feel remotely responsible for what happened before? Well, so many of my patients uh, begin with not acknowledging and, and keeping a secret um, is, is not the way forward. Uh, the first step is acknowledgement. Certainly you are not your ancestors. You are not your ancestors actions. But if you, you keep that as that, that is a dark, dirty secret that you never, oh, talk, well, that's a different thing. never talk about, you never have a chance to acknowledge it and to heal from it. Um, so, so, so yes, so, so certainly in, in the therapeutic process, one, one must, for, for instance, uh, children who are the victims of abuse, um, you know, so often that is, so, that is buried um, in their psyche and, and the first, uh, and they don't understand why they're, they're carrying around this depression, this anxiety, uh, this, this tormented uh, sense of themselves until at some point they, they can acknowledge that the abuse did happen and, and, and make peace with it, which is, which is a long process to make peace with it. I don't think anyone's talking about uh, making public confessions. None of us are, are suggesting that. Uh, we're talking about person to person, individual acknowledgement of what you know had occurred so that you, you, you have someone to share it with and who can look you in the face and say, hey, you, you know, I, I, I honor your courage and your strength in being able to acknowledge, uh, you know, dirty secrets, because all families have dirty secrets. This is the uh, first I'm understanding that to be the case. We're not talking about a public disclosure. Then. Let's go to no. Bill then, because Bill, what did it do for you to go, as you said to me in my telephone conversation with you last night, come out, so to speak, about this? Yeah. Uh, it, what led me to come out was, was two things. Number one, the history of my own family. But number two, and I want to make this really clear, I am a recovering racist. It's not just about my grandfather or Buck Owens or anybody, uh, Buck Martin or anybody. It's because I grew up in that world and I was of that world. When I was a kid, um, I was a racist, and um, I still find myself from time to time having these automatic reactions to people based upon color, okay? So I'm recovering, So, I, and I would suggest as, as a person uh, who, who's, a, who's white in this society that a lot of my brothers and sisters are exactly the same place that I am, particularly if they're of that of the age range, uh, you know, 70s, 60s, 70s, and, and, and older, because we grew up in segregation. We were part of the system. So it ain't about just, you know, the, the, the ancestors. It's also about us. And this, this society has made great progress in the last 50, 60 years, but it's still got a long way to go. And, and there's some backsliding going on that, that Sylvia and others have been talking about, which makes it doubly important that people name it. And if, if other people want to come out, quote unquote, as I did, I encourage them. I encourage them to do that because the more people who come out, the less of a uh, uh, the less weird and scary it seems. Dylan? And that's what the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa was about. 
Did you have a question, Dylan? I had something to, to throw in here. There is the the issue of you know pu fear of public persecution of you know admitting your these uh, these sorts of things, and I think that we I, I think this can be an issue with the normal everyday person. I think it does get overblown with celebrities though. Just to uh, sit, we'll go off of what uh, John said earlier with uh, with uh, Paula Dean as a an example, just for the record, after Paula Dean lost her Food Network show, she did launch in 2013. In 2015, she launched the Paula Deen channel on Roku. In 2015, she was a uh, a star on Dancing with the Stars. She launched a syndicated TV show, Positively Paula, in 2016. She was a uh, she appears on the Home Shopping Network, uh, Shop HQ, and in 2021, she was a uh, guest host of Master Chef on Fox with uh, Gordon Ramsay. So not completely canceled, it sounds. Uh, in that situation, she seemed to recover quite well. Uh, uh, Bill, did you have? It? We're running down to our final few minutes here. Were there any other anecdotes that you wanted to add before we ran out of time here in this nine o'clock hour? When I was uh, about twelve, we had a an African American maid who cleaned the house. So what? What else is new, right? And she had a daughter, and that daughter, who was my age, collected stamps, and I collected stamps. And uh, so she would bring her daughter from time to time when she was working at our house. And the daughter and I started trading stamps. Um, when my mother found out about it, the, the cleaning lady and her daughter disappeared, which was another reminder to me, you don't cross that line. That's the history that many people my age grew up with. When you say disappeared, you mean more than just terminated from the job? Well, terminated from the job. Never saw him again. Yeah. All right. So, Sylvia and Zaki, my question to you is, in Bill's situation, you know, kids know what they're taught. There's only so much responsibility that a kid has. You grew up in that environment. This is what's normalized to you. This is what life is. You become an adult. This is the way you were raised. At what point along the way does it transfer to the adult to understand the difference between good and evil, right and wrong? Well, in terms of college kids and going off to school and rediscovering yourself, it's a really important rite of passage for a lot of, a lot of students. I think it is a time for students, this is what I'm observing with my students, to question some of their old beliefs and to cast off some things, to pull up other things. It's, it's an important rite of passage to be able to uh, look at, with a critical eye, some of the ideas that you've been brought up with, not that you're going to cast everything off, but that you're going to simply learn to think critically and that is what not to try to tell young people how to think but to tell them to question to tell them to be aware of history and you can't do that if uh, a legislature or whatever is is telling you what you can teach and what you can't teach you have to be able to explore truth where it takes you and not to make people feel bad but to certainly make people develop a critical eye and think for themselves so key 60 seconds I, I just want to say that, that I think all of us walk around with uh, this in, imposter syndrome, with with uh, uh, dark secrets that we think people will reject us for if we reveal them. But as Bill had alluded to, uh, making oneself vulnerable ha has the, the effect of making you very attractive. And I, I find that when I'm working individually with patients that... Uh, you know, you have to go through the vulnerability to get to a sense of freedom. And, and, and that's what we're hoping will happen in our community. Bill Thompson, and, thank you very much, and, by the way. Uh, you, go ahead, Bill, wrap it up. I got about 20 seconds. Well, I, I just want to say amen to what Zachy just said. Uh, you know, it's empowering to tell the truth. It's empowering to be vulnerable. It's empowering to be honest. And that's how healing works. Bill, thank you so much. We appreciate your story this morning. Appreciate you coming on to tell it. My pleasure. Bill Thompson, Dr. Sherbet, thank you very much for coming in today.
happy to do it. Dr. Zakeem McGill, great to see you again. Good seeing you, Ron. We're back with the final 50 seconds after this.